Amen. <clears throat> well, as you know, that's a declaration that can only be made in the event that we have a relationship with God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So hopefully every one of us are able to say that with confidence, with certainty, that when the roll is called up yonder, I will be there. But in the meantime, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're in this place today to honor the one who's made a path for us to find ourselves in the presence of God for all of eternity by the sacrifice that He made for us on the cross. And today, it's good to be back with you. We did have a Sunday away, along with a few other days. We made about a 1,200-mile run up and down the roads of Texas and saw some family and friends and did a few other things that we wanted to do. But we enjoyed our time away, but we always know that it's great to be back here, to worship with our family of faith, to honor God together with you as we lift up His wonderful and matchless name. We're going to return to the book of Isaiah for our study this morning. We're going to be in one of the favorite chapters, I think, at least with, with one of the favorite sections or segments of verses in Isaiah chapter 40 that many people turn to much of the time whenever they find themselves sort of lagging in their spirit. And today, hopefully, we'll be able to, to cover the ground necessary to get us to address that passage some. But in the meantime, we're going to uh, just follow the, the lead of the Lord and let Him speak, hopefully, through us and to us as he calls us to himself through Isaiah chapter 40. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn there this morning for the reading of the Scriptures from God's Word. We're going to read and, and skip around a little bit, so we'll be first of all in verses 1 through 8, and then we will move to verses 28 through 31 as the concluding part of our Scripture reading this morning. So Isaiah writes these words, <clears throat> Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Then in verse 28, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we have just concluded a little run here and there around the state of Texas. And several years ago, I came to learn something as we would make journeys something like, similar to that. And that is that if we ever get to the place in the, the travel where this little ding, ding, ding starts happening because the gas tank has gotten to a certain level that's lower than that light will stay off for, that somebody who rides along with me tends to get a little nervous. I don't really know why. I've, I think in, probably in all of our journeys, I've only run out of gas one time. And that wasn't my fault. It wasn't. We started to from here across the way to toward Paris, and uh, we at that time were pulling this camper, and the mileage meter said that we had enough gas to get there. Apparently, it didn't take into account that we were pulling a camper, 
and that significantly decreases the gas mileage that your vehicle gets. And so somewhere just the other side of Honey Grove, in the words of my old granddaddy, whenever he would go to start his vehicle and it wouldn't, she refused to testify. <laughs> and there we were. And I think that's the only time, as, as I recall, in all of our married life that that's happened. In fact, it may be the only one of two times that that's happened in all of my whole driving experience. I don't like to run out of gas. Sometimes, whenever I push it spiritually, however, I find myself running low in my spiritual gas tank. I find myself kind of bottoming out in terms of my ability to find energy and vitality and supply for what I need and want to do. I've got some good news for us this morning. God never runs out of gas. The resources that God has at His disposal and which He makes available to us are endless in supply. There is no limit to what God can do. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about three different ideas, and we'll get to those in the outline a bit later. But there are three words that I want you to think about this morning in terms of understanding the, the absolute limitlessness of God's ability to supply these things. These three words are words that you might want to jot down, but they'll be, again, they'll show up in the outline a little, little bit later on. But the first word is the word pardon. Okay? That's the first word. God is unlimited in His ability to provide pardon for our failures. Secondly, is the word promises. The promises of God are not conditional upon our ability to keep a similar promise. If God makes a promise, He is more than able to keep that promise. The third word that I want you to think about this morning as we make our way through this message is the word power. There, there is no end to the power of God. He is omnipotent. That means that He has all power all the time. And there's never anything that diminishes that. There are no power surges with God. The, the lights of heaven never blink. God has all power. And His power is all sufficient. So I want us to think about those three words as we move through this passage. And hopefully we can get the fullness of this. It's, it's not a guarantee, but I want you to think with me this morning about the sufficiency of God's resources. And as we read this passage a bit ago, I, I want you to think about it in terms of this chapter helping us to see the availability of God's all-sufficient resources on display. God has put in front of us in this chapter divine resources, and He says, I want you to take a look at these. I want you to have a listen, if you will, to what I'm going to say. And as you listen to what I'm saying, I want you to understand that there is nothing within the context of what I lay out in front of you that I don't have every capability of supplying. There are th these three areas of need that God capably addresses here, and the result of them is what I want us to try to consider this morning. The first one is found in those first verses. I want to just review them real quickly for us. It begins this way, God speaking through Isaiah, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Here we see that comfort is made available to the people of God in the fullness of God's pardon. Now, I don't know about you, but I like the idea of comfort. Very few of us like to, to find ourselves in places where we are uncomfortable. We don't like to have experiences that discomfort us. The fact is that sometimes, however, whenever we move in directions or make choices that are different than God would have us to make or choose, this ends up putting us in a place where God needs to make us uncomfortable in order for us to recognize and realize and understand that the only source of true comfort is God Himself. That's what's happened with the people of God in this chapter. The people of God have 
pursued their own ends. They've designed a plan for themselves that is different than God's plan for them. And as they've de designed this plan, they become discomforted. In fact, they have become completely out of their homeland. God has disrupted their life completely. Everything that they knew and everything that they loved, everything they relied on, everything they counted on, everything they found comfort in was taken from them. And so they were in a very uncomfortable place in their lives, a place of terrible unrest. And, and yet God speaks into the midst of that, and he says, tell the people that comfort is coming their way. In fact, he doesn't just say that comfort is coming their way. He says, double comfort, comfort my people, comfort my people. Now, he says it twice for emphasis sake, and what he means is this, that at the level at which they've been uncomfortable or discomforted, now I'm going to provide double comfort for them. And so he says, this is going to come in the form of a pardon that is issued from my hand. Now, when we think about that word pardon, sometimes if we're not careful, we may minimize the impact of that. There's a, a sense in which we use that word that, that's pretty low level, I would say. If, if we're moving through a, a line and we bump somebody, we may say to them, pardon me. And, and, and what we really mean to say is, I'm sorry I did that. I didn't mean to. Or if, if somebody says something and we don't quite hear it, we may say to them, I beg your pardon. And, and what we're really saying is, can you repeat that? But whenever we begin to look at the idea of pardon here, there really are two aspects of it that come to light in this particular section of Scripture. The first one has to do with what I would call the absence or the conclusion of conflict. These people have been in conflict, and this is what has made them discomforted. This is what has caused them unrest. And so they've been engaged in this terrible conflict. Now, granted, this conflict has made its way into the ranks of national war. They, they've been involved in warfare for a season. But, but I want to tell you that whenever it comes down to it, the, the ultimate source, the ultimate cause of their conflict has to do more with what, how they've responded and reacted to God in a negative way than it does to do with the effect that that's had on them because they've done so. So whenever God begins to speak about comfort, the first thing he says is this, that their warfare has ended. So this suggests that there's been a conflict. Now let me tell you this. And I want you to hear me very clearly here. Any conflict is harmful. Conflict is just not a good thing for us. Any conflict that is present in our lives is something that should be dealt with. And, and it should be dealt with in a biblical manner. When, when there's conflict between a person and a person, that conflict ought to be addressed, and it ought to be addressed with the love of Christ behind it and the spirit of resolution within it. Conflict between two people is a problem. But I want to tell you something. Whenever that conflict that he's speaking about here exists, that is the conflict between a people and their God, that's a bigger problem. And that's where the people of Israel were. That's where the, the Jewish people found themselves at this point. They were in a conflict with God. And so what God does is he comes to them and he says, okay, we're now at a point to where everything is going to change. This conflict that is present because of your responses to my purpose and my plan for your life, the conflict that is present, it's over. God declares that the conflict is finished. Now that doesn't come because the people have come to a place where they've brought to God sufficient sacrifices. If you remember, whenever we read back in the early part of the book of Isaiah, God says to them, I am sick of you parading this mass of animals in front of me and offering them and thinking that that's what I want from you. God has actually brought them to a place where their heart has become broken before the Him. And as that happens, what God says to them is this, your conflict with me is now concluded. See, what happens is that Scripture describes us as a place, at a place in our lives, before we come to Him through the path that He's provided, as needing reconciliation with Him. Be reconciled to God. 
And, and, and every one of us, <clears throat> before we come to the place where we accept God's offering of, of, of peace and, and atonement, we are in conflict with God. But whenever God extends to us pardon through His Son Jesus, and we receive what He's offering, then God says to us, the warfare's over. The conflict is concluded. So that's the first part of the idea of this pardon that's issued. The second part of it is this. Not only does it include the presence, I mean, the, the conclusion of conflict, but it also includes the forgiveness of failure. Look at what he says. Not only is her warfare ended, but tell her that her iniquity is pardoned. Her sins are forgiven. For she has received from the Lord's hand half of all of her sins. Y'all aren't looking at your Bibles, are you? <laughs> for she has received from the Lord double for all of her sins. We, we sing a song sometimes that says, My sins, they are many. But His grace, His forgiveness, His love toward us is so much more. I want to tell you something. You can never out the grace of God. Now, that doesn't mean you ought to go try. Because he, Paul addresses that in Romans chapter 6. But I'm telling you this morning that you may be at a place where you think, I have gone so far that God has no use for me. He does not want me any longer. I want to tell you something. Whenever God extends a pardon, He says it's more than enough to cover all your sin. And so He, he says that the iniquities are pardoned. So whenever, whenever God extends this pardon, by His grace, He extends forgiveness for the failures of His people. And I want you to understand that the, the implications of the word pardon, there's a legal connotation to that where there's something that has been offered to offset a crime that has been committed. And what God says is the extent of your crimes doesn't phase me. The extent of your failures doesn't phase me. No matter what you think you've done that is beyond the reach of God's grace, God says, I can extend double pardon for all your sins. That's a good word this morning. I figured that at least get a whispered amen. It's a good word because God says to us, I will pardon your iniquities. He said it to a, a whole nation of people. And, and so the pardon from God, I want you to know, is vital to the discomforted soul. Maybe you're here this morning or you're hearing this message in another place and, and what's happening in your life is that your soul is troubled. Your soul is in conflict. Your soul is discomforted. Well, I want you to know that the pardon that God offers, the pardon that God extends is necessary, it's essential, it's vital for the troubled and discomforted soul. It's vital for the conflicted heart, the sinner, the one who has fallen out of fellowship with God, the one who's never entered into a relationship with God. God says to you, I extend my pardon to you and I will forgive you and set things right. That's a good word. Thank you, Lord, for the comfort that comes our way through the pardon that you offer and extend. The second thing that we see in this chapter, not only is comfort found in the fullness of God's pardon, but we also see that confidence is found through faith in God's promises. Now, in verse 3 of this chapter, God, uh, God begins to speak through Isaiah, and he says something about the path that is going to be made available for those who step into the fullness of the pardon that God is offering. He says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now, this is an announcement of the coming Messiah. And he says, this is what God is going to do. He's going to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. A highway suggests easy access. It suggests that there's a, a clean path forward. There's no construction going on there. The path is already made complete. It's available. It's open. Then he says, every valley shall be exalted. In other words, the low places will be raised up to where they're level too. The crooked place, every mountain and hill shall be brought low. There will be no hills to climb, no mountains to hinder your progress. The crooked places shall be made straight. You don't have to slow down for curves. And the rough place is smooth, no potholes. He's saying that, there's this, that God is going to make a way to come into the fullness of the pardon that he offers, and that way is going to be accessible. It is going to be available for everyone who comes. And I believe that it's God's word that says, everyone who comes to him 
that he will in no wise cast them out. He, he makes himself available. He makes himself accessible to those who stand in need of pardon. So if, if you're here this morning and, and your life is, is conflicted and, and you're uncomfortable, discomforted by the, the presence of failure before God, I want you to know that God says, you don't have to have climb any hills. You don't, you don't have to, to, to do a lot of works to be right with me. All you have to do is get on this path that God has provided, and that path is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you come through him, he will in no wise cast you out. And he will extend forgiveness full and free through belief, confidence in his name. So he says that this is what God wants to do. And he says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Here he is, he's, he's saying the mouth of the Lord has spoken, and you can count on that, you can rely on that, you can have confidence in the promises of God, you can believe God, you can take God at his word. And the voice said, cry out. He said, what shall I cry? He says, I want you to remind them first of the frailty of life. I want you to point out to everybody that life is temporal, that life is tenuous, that life is frail and fragile. How does he say that? He says, tell them that all flesh is grass. Your flesh, he says, is like grass. What does he mean by that? He says, all of its loveliness is like the flower of the field. Now, we've just come out of winter, more or less. We're coming out of winter. And, and we can look around, and, and in fact, we were doing that a little bit in our yard yesterday, and we were saying, okay, what survived and what didn't? What do we have to replace and what can we keep? What's going to turn green and what's going to bloom? And the fact is that some will and some won't. And what he's saying about flesh is that, that it's like that. Your flesh, your humanity is like that. That your flesh is, is subject to corruption. Your flesh is subject to ruin. Your flesh is subject to frailty. So he reminds of the frailty of life by talking about, first of all, it's temporality. Life hangs by a thread. You never know. And he says that it's like grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. And he says, not only is it, is it temporary, but it's also troubled. He says the grass withers, the flower fades, and the people are like grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. He says that three times in there. You're withering and you're fading. All of us are withering and fading. Our life is always going to give way to everything that comes against it to deteriorate it and ultimately to destroy it. Our flesh is going to give way to corruption. So he reminds them of the frailty of life, but then he comes back and he says, and over against that, I want you to remind also of the reliability of God's truth. Look at what he says. The grass does wither, the flower does fade, People are just like that, but the Word of our God stands forever. He says, do not put your confidence in your, your longevity, your, your, your personal strength, the strength of your, of your flesh. Put it in the promises of God. Trust in what God has said to be true. Trust that God has opened up a path and invites you to get on that path. And he's made it a, a path that's straight and smooth. And he wants you to walk that path straight to the forgiveness that comes through his son, the Lord Jesus. He's saying, what is he saying? He's saying, you want, you want the, the conflict of your soul to end? You want it to conclude? Come to Jesus. You want the conflict of your soul to conclude? Bring your life to him. Lay your life before him, and he will Bring that pardon to your life. So you have confidence that's found through faith in God's promises. You have comfort that's found through the pardon that God has extended. The last part of this chapter, beginning in verse 9, going through verse 31, helps us to see that courage is also found when God's power becomes operative in our lives. God's power. I want you to think about that for a moment. God's power is a real thing. 
God's power is something that is, is the, 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 the process by which everything that exists, exists. It is only by His power that anything that is made was made. God's power is indefinable. It's unlimited. It's beyond the scope of anything that we can get our minds around. And so in verse 9, he begins to talk about this. And verse 10, he continues. And, and I want to just kind of try over the next hour or so. <laughs> no, it won't take that long, I hope. Uh, but, uh, but I want to show you how, how, first of all, that in this passage, the, the person of God is, is explained. If you can explain God, he's, he's pretty well gives a, a, some, some insight into who he is here. And so he says, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, okay, all the things that they've gone through, I want you to come now and say to them, listen, you're looking at eye level. You're seeing all of your trouble, all of your conflict, all the things that have been disastrous for you. But now, Isaiah, I want you to go to them, and I want you to stand up on a high hill and say, quit looking at your troubles and look to God. And this is the God that he describes. He says, behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand. Your God has a strong hand with an arm that will rule for him. He comes with a reward. His reward is with him and his work before him. He'll flee, feed his flock like a shepherd. He will take care of you. He'll gather all the lambs with his arm. Those who are weaker, he'll support them. He'll carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. He understands the condition in which he finds us, and he speaks to that. He addresses that, and then he begins to describe the massive, amazing nature of God. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? You think about that. He's saying about God, whenever you look at all the waters of the earth, that God has measured them in the hollow of his hand. He says he's calculated the dust of of the earth. He's measured the heaven with a span and he's calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. God calculates the dust of the earth. He's weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. So he says, this is the God we're talking about here who comes to you and offers pardon and comfort through that pardon and offers confidence because of his promises. And he says, this is who he is. What has he done? He's directed the spirit of the Lord or as, who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him. With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him the knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? He's saying, no one did because no one had to. He's the author. He's the initiator of all all of these things. He's the author of true counsel. He's the author of instruction. He's the author of justice. He's the author of knowledge. He's the author of understanding. God has all of this within his own nature and within himself. So let's trust in the nations, right? Look at what he says, verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as small dust on the scales with which God measures all that and weighs all that. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. How many nations? Wait a minute. Not this one, right? He's talking in relative terms. He's talking in comparative language. And he says, whenever you begin to weigh the power of every nation, when you begin to weigh the capability of all the peoples of the earth, when you begin to weigh all of that against God in his massiveness, in his power, in everything that he generates, there is nothing compared to him. And they're counted by him less than nothing and worthless. So he says, what are you going to do? Are you going to make some likeness that represents this God? He says, to whom will you liken God? What likeness to what likeness will you compare him? The workman, he says, molds an image. The goldsmith then takes that image and overspreads it with gold. And the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution, they just choose a tree that will not rot. And he seeks for himself a skillful workman to pre prepare a carved image that will not totter. In other words, he says, so what do you do in, in, in light of the fact 
that, that, that you're human and you can't grasp the, the massiveness of this God, what do you do? Well, you build your own. You build your own God. You, you create an idol. And so, and so what he's saying here is that, that this, is, this is the way humans respond. When they see something that is larger than they can comprehend, they try to minimize it and shrink it down to something that they can get a hold of. And he says, so ra rather than turning to the God who in all of his power has made them, they make a God that they can have power over. I can never imagine, but they do it, why people would worship God at the footstool of something that they have to pick up and carry and put in a wagon or a cart or wherever and move it from place to place as they did and still do in some places on this earth. It blows my mind. I don't get it. Why would I worship something that I made instead of someone who made me? But that's what happens. He says we can't get our minds around God, so we make a God that we can get our minds around. And so he, he goes on and he talks about, have you not known, have you not heard, has it not been told you from the beginning, have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? I think he's saying here that you don't get it, do you? It is he, God, who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted, scarcely shall they be sown, scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and you see who's created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and the strength of his power. No one is missing. So, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. Why do you say about yourselves, God doesn't know what's going on in my life? I want to tell you something. God knows everything that's going on in your life. He knows everything that's going on in my life, and He cares deeply. And so verse 28, where we see now how courage is found when God's power becomes operative. The person of God having been explained, he moves to the power of God and how it's employed. He says, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. This is who we turn to. This is who we trust in. This is who we believe in. What does he do? He gives power to the weak. Are you weak this morning? Are you here and your strength seems to be diminished, waning, giving way to all the pressures and the difficulties and the challenges and the stressors of life? He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint, He says, and be weary. And the young men, like me, Again, it's all relative language, right? <laughs> and the young men shall utterly fall. So he says that we all find ourselves in this place where we need a strength that is stronger than ourselves, where we need a resource that is greater than anything that we can provide. Where do we go? He says, you look to the everlasting God. You look to the one who measures the waters in the hollow of his hand. You look to the one who looks on the nations as if they're nothing. You look on the one who is God, and you trust him. <clears throat> and he says whenever this happens, what God does in verse 31, those who wait for him, those who trust in him, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So God says that his power is accessible, it's available, and when it's employed, it makes a difference. And so th this, this, this opportunity of God is extended for pardon through his promises to live in the operation of his power. I, I don't know, I mean, I can tell you that when we, become, when, we, when we look at these last verses of this chapter, there have been 
There has been sermon after sermon after sermon preached on just those verses. So I know that we have, we have skipped across the surface of this chapter today. And I also know that you didn't think it could be done by me. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you this. With God, all things are possible. But I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts out of this chapter before we conclude this morning. And I want, it, I want it to relate to the, the unlimited resources of God, the sufficiency of everything that God provides, the, the, the ability of God to, to bring a conclusion to conflict and to bring confidence in light of his promises and to bring courage because he pours his strength into us. So what do I want to say? This only. God's involvement is always meant to improve our situation. God doesn't lead us into a path that's going to cause us to be diminished or to become less than we are. He always desires to improve our situation. And through the three things that I've told you, I want to just kind of rehearse those real quickly with you. The first way is this. His intention is always to redeem us. If, if we are in a fallen state, if we've never come to the place where we've received the forgiveness from God over our sin, Initially, we're lost, we're separated from God by our sin. God wants to redeem you. If, if you've stumbled along the way, you've made some mistakes. They may be bad mistakes. You, you've committed some sins, and they may be hor hor horrible sins. But I want you to know that God wants to redeem you from that. You're a believer, and, and you're distant from God. God wants to redeem you from that. It is always God's intention to redeem us. Secondly, God's instruction is always meant to sustain us. Whenever God lays out his promises before us, those are words of instruction that help us know how to live. And, 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 and so much of the time, whenever God says in his promises, if you listen to me and if you follow this path, then you are going to gain the benefit of the promises I'm extending to you. And so what you have here is God instructing us by the promises that he gives to us. And so his instruction is always meant to sustain us. And then finally, God's interaction is always meant to revitalize us. <clears throat> Whenever God begins to stir around in your life, even if it's uncomfortable at the start, when he begins to stir around in your life, please understand that the reason he's doing that is because he wants to bring you to a place of renewal. He wants to bring you to a place of greater vitality, greater energy in your spiritual life. So, so that he can take your life and use it by, by the operation of his power in and through you to cause you to become a great vessel, a great tool, a mighty presence who's carrying the name of God to a world that really does need to know that he's the everlasting God, that he does not faint, he does not grow weary. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings like eagles. They'll walk and not be weary. They'll run and not faint. All for the glory of His name, because then we can only point back to God and say, I couldn't do this for myself. I tried. My, my resources were depleted pretty quickly. But whenever God began to infuse me with Himself, after I received his pardon, after I believed his promises, and he began to pour his power into me, suddenly, suddenly, my energy renewed. My vitality was restored. Where are you at this morning? In your spiritual journey, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you overwhelmed, overcome? Are you beat down? Do you need God to speak into your life and to breathe into your soul? He waits to do that, and he is more than capable of doing so. I'm going to ask you please to bow your heads. As we prepare for an opportunity to respond to what God's word has spoken to our hearts, I want to ask you to be honest with God this morning. And, and if you're here and, and you'd have to say, Lord, I, my, my spirituality is... It's running low. My energy, my spiritual energy is running low. And 
it's just hard for me spiritually to put one foot in front of the other right now. And I just need you. I need you. Maybe God is saying to you, then, I'm willing to forgive. I'm willing to restore. Trust me. Follow me. Accept from me my grace, my love, and my mercy. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never yet received from God the life that comes through belief in the name of the Lord Jesus. And today, you would say, I want Jesus in my life. If he can bring life where there is no life, if he can bring energy where there is no energy spiritually, if he can bring vitality where there's no spiritual vitality, I want Jesus in my life and I want to explore what that looks like. Then today may be a day where you need to actually put steps to the the longings of your heart. Our ministers will be down front here in just a moment, and as I finish leading us in prayer, I'm going to ask all of us to stand in a moment, and whenever that happens, as the music plays, I'm just going to invite you to step out from where you are and come to one of our ministers, and just to tell them what's going on, and to say, maybe I just, maybe you just need them to pray with you, or maybe you need some guidance. Maybe you're wanting to inquire about how to become a member of this church, and they would be happy to take this time to visit with you about that as well. We just want to be available to you to help you with any question, any circumstance that may have become too heavy for you to carry on your own. Father, we come in Jesus' name, and we thank you that through him we can have access to the sufficiency of your resources. Thank you that through him we can receive pardon. Thank you that through him your promises are made complete. Thank you that through him we can live in the fullness of your power. Today, Lord, here we are. Speak to us, please, and help us to know what you know about us, maybe better than we know about ourselves. Help us to identify what is needed and to just respond in faith, in belief, and in trust so that Jesus may be glorified in my life would you stand to your feet heads bowed eyes closed if you need to come today to visit with one of our ministers would you please make your way out from where you are right now if you need to come and talk about salvation or talk about God's revitalizing presence in your life or just pray the altars are open whatever whatever you need this is your time to respond to what God's word has said